the, um, the passage we're looking at this morning, which I would say is Paul's introduction uh, to, of, um, of his, uh, his theme uh, to the Galatians. And he, let's just say he, he kind of jumps in swinging, uh, especially against those false teachers because of just the absolute danger of following them. And let me just say, as we, as we look at the error of the, the Judaizers, uh, who again, who are adding uh, to the free grace that God gives to us through the gospel, that this imprecation, this curse, this anathema that um, Paul pronounces against them, and you know, we, we don't often see these kinds of things in Scripture, but sometimes we do run into them, um, that this really applies to every religion that distorts the gospel in any way, or that replaces it with something that is not a gospel. And what they all have in common is that they are all works-based systems of religion, okay? Whereas the gospel is based upon the works of Christ alone. All the other religions either are a mixture of both or purely man's works. And this anathema applies to all of them. This is what Paul writes beginning in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent for men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches, notice churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ." Well, Paul was not a man pleaser, okay? He said things the way they actually are. And so when he says this, he is in dead earnestness, and this is the Word of God. All right, well, as I mentioned before, we, we recently finished Paul's letter to the Romans, which was his explanation of the gospel of God's free grace to a church he had neither planted nor visited, but which we saw he, he hoped to visit soon, that he might ground them in the truth so that they wouldn't be led astray by the enemy. I mean, isn't that the purpose of being discipled in the Lord Jesus Christ, is that we know the truth so that we can hold it firmly and recognize the counterfeits when they, when they come. Well, in the letter that we're beginning this morning, Paul is again explaining the gospel, but this time as an antidote to an error the enemy had already introduced. An, en an error that the enemy often uses, almost exclusively, adding works to the meritorious grounds of our justification. Now, I realize those are probably some highfalutin words. Meritorious, what does that mean? Well, it means earning something, merit, okay? Justification, what is that? that well, that's God declaring us righteous. Uh, in, in His court of justice, that we are righteous and the basis of it, according to Paul's gospel, is what Jesus has done. But Satan's gospel always includes something we do, okay? And that's what we need to avoid. Shortly after Paul had preached to these Galatian Gentiles, a group of Jewish so-called believers, they were professing faith in Christ, came with a different message. Yes, you, you need the Messiah, he is the fulfillment of, of God's gracious covenants. You can't be saved without trusting Him, but there's something more that you must do. Okay? You must become Jews. You must be circumcised. 
and keep the Mosaic law. After all, the, the Messiah is a Jewish Messiah, and he's for God's people. You need to become a, a part of God's people in order to be saved by their Messiah. Now, faith, they believed, was something that God was now adding, faith in Christ, to the old covenant. Christ is like the cherry on top, so to speak. You know, it doesn't really change everything underneath, but it's the culmination. And so we, we keep that foundation and we simply add Christ to it. They, that's how they're viewing it. Instead, as Paul is saying, the way we should view it is the one who comes and fulfills these covenants and replaces it with a new covenant. Now, as I've already mentioned, this was the same issue brought to the Jerusalem Council by the representatives of the Gentile church at Antioch when the Judaizers came to them. So not surprisingly, Paul's solution to the question is going to be the same. If the Gentiles receive the Spirit, that's very key, the reception of the Holy Spirit. How does one receive the Spirit? Is it through the gospel of God's free grace or the gospel of works? Okay, um, if they've received the Spirit, okay, um, by trusting in Jesus Christ alone, showing that God had accepted them by faith, without being circumcised, and without obeying the law, to add these things now makes them only go backwards rather than forwards, and it destroys the gospel of grace. Now, as Paul addresses this issue in his letter, I think what he does here, probably more than in any other letter, except, well, I think we, we get a lot of this in um, the, the letter that was written by the author to the Hebrews, okay, where he contrasts the Mosaic Covenant with the new covenant, showing the superiority of the new covenant over the old and how Christ replaces and fulfills the old covenant. Uh, in this epistle, in this letter, Paul spends a lot of time showing the relationship between the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant. Now, that, these are very thorny questions that, you know, as far as trying to work out those relationships, what, what parts of these things continue? What parts have been done away with? Well, Paul is, is going to tell us, you know, that, um, well, yes, the new covenant is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, but the Mosaic covenant was like this teacher or tutor that was added in order to um, show the heirs of this promise given to Abraham their need of the Messiah. And now the Messiah has come, it's been done away with. That's going to be the, the main argument uh, throughout this, so that we don't go back to the Mosaic covenant but instead we move forward and trust in Jesus and in Him alone. Now this morning, let's begin by considering some of Paul's opening comments. His, first of all, his introduction and greeting. Secondly, his expression of concern for the Galatians. And third, his imprecation against those who add works to God's grace. An imprecation, remember, is a curse. Curse is not a good thing. You know, you've probably heard the terms which we, well, I, I guess we do find at least one of them still in modern translations, woe and wheel. You know, we're not familiar with wheel that much. Wheel is blessing, woe is curse. Uh, you're probably familiar that woes are in the New Testament as well. Those are imprecations, those are curses, and those curses always come against those who are leading God's people away from the truth. And the truth is, again, faith in Christ alone. Well, first of all, let's take a look at Paul's greeting in verses 1 through 5. He begins by introducing himself in verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, the Galatians, you know, the, these churches were planted by Paul. They knew who Paul was, but they also knew what his office was that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, in the early church, there were two kinds of apostles. As you know, there were those that were sent by the churches, which correspond to missionaries, right? I mean, when Paul and Barnabas were sent out to do missionary work from Antioch, they were called apostles, and Barnabas was called an apostle. Uh, but there were also those that were sent by Jesus Christ, and those are called the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, sent by Him specifically. 
Now, Paul was both, wasn't he? Uh, he had been sent out by the church at Antioch to be a missionary, but he had also been called by the Lord Jesus Christ, as he says in verse 1, not sent from men, nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now, we have the record of that in the book of Acts as Paul is on his way to, the, to Damascus and Jesus appears to him and calls him. Now, his commission, what, what Paul is doing here at the very outset is he, is he is reminding the Galatians that his commission comes from the top, okay, from the Father who raised Jesus from the dead and from the Son. Paul, at the very beginning of this letter, wants to establish his credentials. Why should you, Galatians, listen to me rather than these Judaizers? Well, you should because he has a personal commission from the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, Paul never relied on that entirely. He didn't say, just believe this because I say it. But he's going to go on to prove, you know, his gospel, his teaching, his doctrine of salvation, or I should say justification by grace through faith alone, through the Old Testament scriptures so that the Galatians can judge for themselves. Remember when Paul was preaching to the Bereans, and Luke, in the book of Acts, commends the Bereans because they examined the scriptures daily to find out whether what Paul was telling them was the actual truth. They knew that God had spoken in the Old Covenant Scriptures, and so they wanted to make sure those things agree. And they should always agree, shouldn't they? God does not contradict Himself. That's one of the reasons why we accept the Bible as the Word of God, is because of the absolute um, harmony between uh, the authors. So this is a reminder to us also to judge everything we hear by the Scriptures, we need to see the truth in the Word of God for ourselves so that our hearts are bound by God's Word and not by any man's opinion. You know, you, we all run into people who say, I believe this because, well, this pastor so-and-so, this great teacher said this, R.C. Sproul said this. That's good. It's good to learn those things, but you need to see that what he is saying or what any teacher is saying is coming out of the Word of God because that's what really matters that is the authority. Now, Paul also forwarded the greetings of those who were with him. He doesn't name them, but they likely knew who they were. And the implication here is that as they are signing on to the letter, that they also were concerned about the condition of the, the Galatians and the danger that they are in. And I think this reminds us that we, as believers, need to be concerned for the broader body of Christ. Because how many churches are there actually in the world? Now, let's see, we got what, Presbyterians, we got Baptists, we got... No, uh, there's many denominations, many fellowships, but there's only one church in this world, isn't there? Even though there are many fellowships, which means that every believer is just as much our brother or sister in the Lord Jesus Christ as we are each other's. And so we need to be concerned for them as well. They are uh, our brethren we're going to be spending eternity with. Okay, now secondly, after identify himself, Paul identifies his recipients to the churches of Galatia. And as I mentioned before, here there's a little bit of a question as to which specific churches he's referring to. He's either referring to the churches he planted in southern Galatia, which corresponds, I believe, to modern-day Turkey, that he planted on his first and second missionary journeys. That would include then the churches in Pisidian Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Derbe. If you remember those churches, uh, there was a little bit of uh, persecution there, but there were those who believed and churches were planted. Or he may be referring to those in northern Galatia that he planted on his second missionary journey and revisited on his third. Or I suppose it could refer to both. But again, the only thing that this has to do with is not who the recipients are. We know they're in Galatia, and we know they're believers, and we know that they're being affected by Judaizers. It, it only has to do with the dating of the letter and whether it is written before or after the Acts 15 council. Now, thirdly, Paul gives his customary apostolic greeting in verses 3 through 5. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Let me just say a couple things about this. Uh, first of all, Paul um, is giving to them, uh, and we may, not, um, we may not recognize it in this way, but this is something Paul always does. He gives his apostolic greeting, and it, there's implied in it uh, a petition to God, grace and peace to you, okay? May God the Father and the Son grant you His grace and, and His peace. Now, the one thing that is odd about these, um, uh, these, these greetings is that um, in every single one of them, they appear to be coming only from the Father and the Son, right? And we're Trinitarians, and we believe that Paul was a Trinitarian, and he believes in the deity of the Holy Spirit, and believes that the Spirit is a person, and equally you know, with the Father and the Son is to be glorified and honored. Why is the Spirit never mentioned in these apostolic greetings? Well, Jonathan Edwards asked that question, and his answer was, the Spirit is there as well. It's just that we don't often recognize Him. The Spirit is the grace that comes from the Father and the Son. Okay, let's not forget that this whole work of redemption that our Lord Jesus Christ did, with the, as we saw last week, the Father giving the price of our redemption, Jesus paying the price of our redemption, the Spirit is the one who is purchased. And He is the grace that is given to us to enable us to believe and also to sanctify us. And He's the one who gives us peace, okay? So when Paul here is asking for grace and peace, what he's praying is that the Father and the Son would send the Spirit into the hearts of his readers so that his peace would be with him. The Spirit of God is the one who gives us that subjective peace. Every, every blessing that we have that is an internal subjective blessing of, of love and peace and joy and all those things comes from the work of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. Now, for the second part of this, of this greeting, we don't want to miss what's implied Paul is reminding them, again, how they were justified, notice. It wasn't through the old covenant circumcision. It wasn't through the works of the law. But by God's giving us His Son, that His Son might give Himself for our sins, that He might rescue us from the kingdom of the evil one, and notice that God the Father might receive all the glory. Okay? That is the issue at stake in this whole controversy is who gets the glory for our salvation? Do we get it? Does God get some and we get some? Or does God alone receive the glory? Now, for the Pharisees and all pure legalists, the glory is all ours. Okay? We do the work. God receives us on the basis of what we do. For the Judaizers or mixed legalists, it's partly God and partly us. Okay? God does His part, and we do our part. Um, and then for Paul, it is God by His grace alone. God does all, and we receive all through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be careful that we do not define faith or see faith as a work that brings down the blessings of God. There are many believers today who see faith in that way, and that really turns it into a work that everybody is capable of doing. And if I just do this, God will look at that faith and count me righteous. That turns faith into a work. Faith is looking entirely away from ourselves to what Jesus Christ has done and receiving His righteousness alone. By the way, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we do need to remember, means to trust Him. He is a real person who has done a real work and He offers Himself to us. And on our part, we need to receive Him. We need to trust Him as our only hope of heaven. That's what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to believe the facts about Him, but to trust Him. Trust Him. We need to meditate on that because, you know, again, I think we often substitute historic faith, believing the facts, for actually trusting in Jesus. All right.
But now Paul moves on to the point of his letter, which is his concern for the Gentiles. One thing that's notable here is that Paul omits his customary thanksgiving. If you read the other letters, after he gives his greeting, he goes on to say how thankful I am for you guys and what the Lord's doing through you. But he doesn't do that here because there is a major concern that he needs to address. He gets straight to the point. He knew the enemy would come and try to undermine his work as he is constantly seeking to do. I mean, just look at the letters that Paul writes and look at all the different things he addresses in those letters. But that these Galatians would so quickly fall away from the truth astonished him. He says in verses 6 and 7, I am amazed that you were so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, God had called them through the, the Apostle Paul by the grace of Christ. Again, the gospel, the good news is that God accepts us. He forgives us. He receives us freely as his own, as a free gift of Christ's righteousness received by faith in him. That's all we need to enter into heaven. The gospel they embraced from these Judaizers was different. It was another. It was a distortion of the truth. In their view, Christ, his work was not enough. There was something more we needed to do, something more we needed to add. It's not by grace alone, but by grace and works. Now, Paul is going to go on through these, this letter to show us that there is nothing that we can add. Remember what he says to the Philippians. All of, all of the works that he was trusting in as a pure legalist, as a Pharisee, he now saw in the face of Christ as a mountain of dung, okay, which means what it says. Dung is probably a euphemism, okay? But worthless, worse than worthless, repugnance and a stench in God's nostrils, that's really what our works are. He says, actually, in Isaiah, our works, not Paul, but Isaiah, that our works are filthy rags. And again, we can elaborate on what that means, but um, repugnant to God. Even if we could obey the, the letter of the law, even if we could do exactly what God tells us to do outwardly, we can never do it inwardly. We cannot obey the spirit of the law by loving God perfectly and having a perfect desire to glorify and honor Him in everything we do. Only Jesus does and only Jesus has. And that's why we need His obedience, His perfect life, His atoning death to make us perfect. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these Judaizers believe that Jesus was the one that the Mosaic Covenant pointed to. He was the fulfillment of the Abrahamic Covenant, the, the seed through whom all the nations would be blessed, but they did not believe that He replaced that covenant, but that He was rather an addition to it. Now, Paul's going to answer that by telling us that now that Christ has come, the Mosaic Covenant is no longer needed. It's the teacher, the tutor that was needed until Jesus came, and now it's done away with. Now, the real question is, why did the Judaizers believe that we still needed the Mosaic Covenant? Why didn't they think that Christ was enough? Well, one commentator believes, and probably not just one, but I think it, it may be commonly held, uh, that the reason why the Judaizers were insisting on this position was mainly to avoid being persecuted by their Jewish brethren. Okay, and listen to what one commentator writes. Reformed commentator says this. The concluding comments in Galatians 6, verses 11 through 18, summarize the epistle's major themes and explicitly identify the Judaizers' fear of persecution as what motivated them to insist on circumcising Gentile Christians. First century Jewish nationalists were apt to persecute any Jews who were seen as overly friendly to Gentiles. Jewish persecution of Christianity in those days often had more to do with the fact that ethnically Jewish Christians would not circumcise Gentiles, 
than with the proclamation of Jesus as the Messiah. Forcing Gentile Christians to take on circumcision could be a good way for Jewish believers to prove their loyalty to Judaism and escape suffering. But to do this, Paul reminds his readers, was to deny the sufficiency of the cross which levels the field for both Jew and Gentile alike before God. Now, that, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? That the Jews were not so much upset by preaching Christ as the Messiah, but it was that these Gentiles could receive the Messiah without being circumcised. They, they still tenaciously clung to the Mosaic economy. And I, I think, you know, we, we can see the difficulty there. How many years had passed since Moses? He, he gave them, you know, the first five books of the Bible, established the Old Covenant. It had been standing now for, for many centuries. And when the Lord sends His gospel, He does give the Jews a good 40 years of preaching of the gospel and 40 years to think about it before He actually tears down the temple and brings a definitive end to the Old Covenant. This was a difficult transition for them, and this is just another symptom of that very problem. But again, to cling to the Mosaic Covenant and to look at it in the way they were looking at it, because the Pharisees were looking at it as the way to be justified, to look at it in that way, that's not the way it, was, it should have ever been viewed. And Paul is going to remind us of that as well. But to view it in that way and to hold on to it while holding on to Christ, again, is simply adding works to faith and that is the issue. Now, finally, we see Paul's response. Curse, the pronouncing of God's curse. You know how we've asked in the past whether those imprecations that we see in the book of Psalms are ever applicable to situations today or maybe outside of the Old Testament setting, which seems to be, you know, maybe a bit more robust with regard to uh, judgment. Okay, although we do see God's judgment breaking in today, but we wonder whether they have any place within the new covenant. Well, think about this. Jesus pronounced woes, God's judgment, the curse, on the cities in which he had done many of his miracles, and yet they rejected him. So rejecting the Messiah brings down the curse of God. I mean, when you think about it, there's a sense in which God's people are blessed because they're in the covenant, but there's also a sense in which they're cursed because they haven't embraced Christ. Uh, so they remain in the curse, and Jesus reminds them that they are still in that curse. Um, he pronounced a woe or a curse upon those who would cause any who believe in him to stumble. He pronounced no less than eight woes or eight curses against the Jewish leaders of his day for leading God's people astray, again, away from Christ and back to the law. And here, Paul does the same against these teachers who would lead God's people away from his gospel. Now, Paul says that this curse rightly belongs to anyone who would distort the gospel of Christ, who would preach a different gospel, who would add works to the grace of God. He said it would apply even to him or to the angels if they should ever do this, he says in verses 9 and 10, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. So again, it applies to anyone who would bring a different gospel. It applies to the Judaizers because they added works. You know, last week we did a little bit of comparative religion study in the evening as we were looking at those religions that claim to believe in a God and then what their writings they say are from God, say about God, and we were comparing that to what we see in the creation about God. Well, we, we noted a few things about them, but let's apply this particular standard to these other religions to see where they fall on the scale of weal and woe, okay, blessing or curse. Roman Catholics, what do they believe? Well, they believe we need faith. They certainly believe we need faith, but they also believe we need to add to that sacraments, 
and particularly penance, because we're going to shipwreck our faith, and we need to restore it. And we need to do that through penance and doing works of, of um, satisfaction and so forth. That There are works that are added into the works of the priest giving us grace and then our cooperation with that grace until we perfect ourselves. So the grace of God plus our efforts. What does Islam believe? Well, the, their profession is there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet, so they believe in a kind of faith. But they also add to it prayer, alms, fasting, pilgrimages, okay? These are things that must be done, the five pillars of Islam, in order to attain heaven, faith plus works. And remember, Islam is really a Christian cult. Okay, there's two religions in the world, Judeo-Christianity and Hinduism. And everything else is really a cult of, of one of those two things, uh, at least those that believe in some kind of a god. They're, they're, they're very purely materialistic religions as well like animists and so forth. Okay, when you get to Hinduism, Hinduism is purely that of works. They believe you're born into this world. Uh, where you start, I'm not sure exactly, but you have to do good works. And if you're not good enough, you'll be reincarnated maybe as an insect or an animal. And then you've, you've got to work your way back to manhood. And then once you become a man, you've got to get good enough so that through this process of life, you know, birth and life and death and rebirth, you eventually become good enough to transcend that cycle and to come to know the one. That's purely works. Mormons, well, you have to believe in the God that created this universe, uh, and He's only one among many. But once you do that, you have to do good works. Okay? You have to, well, especially if you want to be a God, you got to be married in the temple, you've got to do missionary work, go door to door, you, uh, well, and then you get your own planet and you can populate your own planet, become a god and all that. Well, again, that's, that is works, but that isn't even the kind of salvation we're talking about. And what about the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, believe, you need to believe that what we're teaching you is the truth. Then you need to join our organization. And then you need to go door to door with us to share this good news. And the good news is if you join our organization and go door to door with us, <laughs> then you will be a part of paradise. That's purely works, okay? Every religion, apart from biblical Christianity, is a works-based salvation. And, I, you know, even some, sadly, even some Protestants have turned faith into a work. Some in Lutheran circles turn, you know, almost baptism and the Lord's Supper into works that are being done in order to save us, but not all of them. Just have to be very careful. It, it's by faith alone, by which which that's the only way it can be by God's grace alone. But every religion that includes works falls under God's anathema, His curse. Now, for Paul to say that didn't make him very popular during his day, did it? I mean. <clears throat> He says, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now, Paul wasn't concerned about what man thought, uh, what the Jews thought, what the Judaizers thought. He was concerned about what God thought. And you see, that needs to be our concern, doesn't it? You know, we need not only to embrace the truth, but we need to be able to stand up for the truth as well. We need to realize it wasn't popular in Paul's day. It's not going to be popular today either for us to tell people the truth about what their religion teaches and how that contradicts the Bible. It's not going to be easy to tell the truth to people who are involved in sinful lives that they cannot hold on to that sin and still expect to arrive in heaven. They need to trust in Christ and let go of those sins. That is not popular, but let's not forget as we close. James tells us this in James 4, verse 4. Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Okay, you, you can't do both. You can't live in both worlds. You have to step apart from the world and live in the kingdom of light. And you have to be as citizens of the kingdom of light, 
shining that truth, not only living that life, but also promoting those standards and particularly the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not going to make us popular, okay, but at least with the world, but it will make us popular with the one that we really want to please, and that is God Himself. So again, as we, as we begin to get into this letter, let's, let's be reminded that what we're seeking to know is the truth, and then to embrace that truth, and you know, to believe it ourselves, to apply it to ourselves, and then to share that truth, knowing that that is really what is pleasing to God. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for just a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us in this regard, and also to prepare us to come to the table where we will get the help of the Lord's Spirit, that grace that brings peace and, and joy, and the power to, to have the kind of courage we need to stand up for our Lord's truth.